Hey guys, welcome to BP The Bible Perspectives, rebuttal to James Wright interpretation of John chapter 6. Who does the Father draw? Now before we get into it, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. We are deconstructing, we are refuting the interpretation of James White and the Calvinist view of John chapter 6. Now, John chapter 6, and there's actually four verses in John chapter 6, so James is only focusing on verses 44, 45, and 65. Uh, 37 is equally important to their narrative. In other words, how they frame the narrative, how they interpret those verses. And those are one of the strongest verses that Calvinists use in order to back their claims that not all are saved and that only those are saved whom God has chosen. Now, let's quickly review what Calvinism is because that's important to understand why he is so exegeting this verse, this passage of scripture here. Calvinist, as we said, can be defined in what's called the five points of Calvinism or expressed in the acronym TULIP, which the T is total depravity, the U is unconditional election, and the L is limited atonement, the I is irresistible grace, and the P is the perseverance of the saints. Looking at this from another view, this is a Calvinist view of the world and how they view the world. The people represents all the people of the world. And as you can see, there's a separation. So those at the closest, at the closest to the cross, up on the hill, they represent, according to Calvinists, all whom God chose. Now, remember, all of the world uh, is totally depraved, dead in sin. That's the T, total depravity. The U would represent only those whom God has chosen, right? Only those whom God has chosen. Now, in the context, then, of the John chapter 6, that would mean that all that the Father gives me will come to me. So, representing these people close to the cross <coughs> represents God, those whom God has given Christ, according to Calvinism. The other verse, in verse 44, says, No one can come unto me unless the Father uh, draws them. No one can come unto Jesus unless the Father draws them, again, representing those close to the hill. Now, the L in Tulip, then, it limited atonement, meaning that those whom God chose from total depravity world, all of the depraved sinners, that Jesus only died for those whom he's called, represented here by those at the top of the hill. The eye is irresistible grace. God draws them by his irresistible grace, and then they will persevere, P, the tulip, the perseverance of the saints. And in a nutshell, that's Calvinism. Unfortunately, for those at the bottom of the hill, God didn't choose them. So if you go back to the verse in which we are studying, no one can come to me except unless the Father draws. And he's going to get into no one is able to. You cannot come to the Father unless God draws you. Okay? Now, also according to Calvinists, you can't come because God didn't draw you, because God didn't choose you. Therefore, limited atonement doesn't cover you at all for salvation. You have no hope of salvation, no hope of God's mercy, no hope of his love, no hope of his grace to draw you. In other words, you are eternally lost because God didn't 
choose you. And because he didn't choose you, he ain't drawing you. Okay? He's not drawing you because he didn't choose you. Now, that's how Calvinists would kind of frame the narrative. Even if they don't really say it like that. If you look at these people right here, uh, uh, because God, remember Jesus said, no one can come unto the Father unless, no, I'm sorry, no one can come unto me unless the Father draws him. And he only draws those whom he has given to Jesus, which if we use this representation here, those at the bottom of the hill were not given to Jesus and therefore God is not drawing them. Okay. What we're going to look at is on what basis then does God draw? And if he says that all that the Father gives him will come to him, all those verses saying that the people at the bottom of the hill were never, God is never going to draw them because he has never given any of them at the bottom of the hill to Jesus. Is that what John 6, 44, 45, and 65 is saying? Calvinists and John White, I mean, I'm sorry, James White, that's what they're saying. So let's go back to the video. Let's get back into the video. And I did spend a little time. I'm going to uh, of look at a couple of other verses. Looking at a couple of verses, when you say that all that the Father gives to me will come to me. And then remember I showed you a verse in Acts 27 where the angel tells Paul that God has given everyone in the doomed ship to Paul. And not only that, but Paul said, but this is the angel who I belong to. This is the angel that um, I serve. So can we conclude that Paul belongs to this angel? I thought we belonged to God. Does he serve this angel? I thought we served God. So the question is, what did Paul mean by the phrase? We looked at another verse of scripture, of course, in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus said, if your right hand offend you, cut it off. If your right eye offend you, gouge it out. Does he, uh, people have no problems coming up with uh, what Jesus really meant by that. So let's go back. And I want to again, again kind of focus on his, again, explaining uh, the verses 44 through 41. But here we go. Let's express it. Grace is found in the gospel. The gospel itself is gracious. God did not have to do what he did, but he did. So that's where the grace is found. That's why you don't need prevenient grace, is the grace is found in the gospel itself. Mankind has the capacity in of itself. There's no udais dunatai. In now, he's, he's speaking Greek again. I don't, I don't understand Greek. So I, I admit, I've, I've had people that, you know, call themselves inciting, uh, insulting me. I admit I'm, I'm, I'm not that smart. So, okay, if he speaks Greek, which means nothing... By the way, if he's speaking the same Greek that's translated into the same words on the left side of the screen here, why does he need to speak Greek? There is a reason. We'll point that out later. Udai Stunatai means no one is able. There's no Udai Stunatai in provisionism. Everyone has that capacity, hence the gospel. Now, he's going to come back to no one is able by saying no one can, the word can, no one is able, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. What we will see later is what is meant by draw. Here we go. Comes and there is knowledge of what Jesus claims and it's up to the human individual to make the decision one way or the other. And then God acts based upon that, acts based upon his foreknowledge of what those human beings do. I want you to pay attention to the technique here. Some of the words that he used. Now, he, he is saying this is what 
another person he's debated is saying, thus anyone who believes in the grace gospel, this is what we believe. But let me just again show you what we believe right from John chapter 6. And uh, <clears throat> verse 26 again, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat that perished, but for the meat that endured to eternal life, which the Son shall give you, uh, which the Son shall give you. So again, remember, this is the crowd, the very crowd that he is talking to in verse 44, right? They said unto him, verse 28, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe on him who he has sent. So the reason why I say that because the words that he is speaking here on the sly makes it seem like he says, well, this is what Jesus claims. That's not, what? See, that, that's a, that's, again, that's a kind of a sly way of uh, destroying straw man. Okay. All right, here we go. There's all sorts of theological problems with that, but that's that's the theory. Well, here's a... So, what are the theological problems? What is the theological problems right here when they ask Jesus, what must we do to work the works of God? And then Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. Now, again, remember, we looked at, we started from the beginning of chapter 6. We just didn't slice into verse 44. This is the beginning. So the very, the same crowd that he is speaking to in verse four, verse 44 is the same crowd that he is telling them to believe on him whom he has sent. Same crowd, remember? In John 6, 45, everyone who is taught of God, everyone who hears the message, everyone who's learned from their father comes to Christ. So keep this in mind. He just made this statement. Everyone, well, this crowd was taught by Jesus personally the day before. He taught them the kingdom of God, healed their sick miraculously, fed them miraculously in person, right? He did this in person. So again, you're either a universalist or... You're reformed. So why only two? That's just asinine to say that you're either one or the other, since most people don't even know what universalist is. And universalist is that everyone, they believe everyone is saved. Everyone. So basically he is saying that the world of Christianity is divided into two camps. Those that believe that God only chooses some to be saved or that everyone is saved. I say neither is true, but there is another. Work for the bread that leads to eternal life. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he sent. That's what we believe. So it's not the two camps that he you know, uh, is saying you either one or the other. No. The idea to say, to put up the straw, uh, the, the universal part is to, it's an easily destroyed straw man. Because, like I say, most people don't even believe in that doctrine. Most people don't believe, most Christians, I should say, don't believe that everyone is saved no matter what. Because this communication of knowledge is effective. There is no one to whom the Father has revealed this knowledge that does not come to Christ. So i got to say, what knowledge is he referring to then? What knowledge is he referring to? Right? What knowledge is he referring to when Jesus says to them, 
uh, verse, uh, it says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But as I said to you, that you also have seen me and believe not. So what knowledge is he saying? Because they do have knowledge. They were personally taught by Jesus the day before. So what knowledge don't they have? This crowd that Jesus is speaking to, what knowledge don't they have? Because he said, everyone that is taught by God will come, right? Everyone that's taught by God will come. Jesus taught them. What didn't he teach them then? What was the knowledge that Jesus didn't teach them, but yet telling them to believe? but telling them that God would give them something, the Father would give them something, Jesus would give them something, what knowledge don't they have? Okay? So the only two logical results from that is you either need to recognize the existence of the elect or you become a universalist. We need to recognize the existence of the elect. Who needs to recognize that? Well, now think about that. Who needs to recognize the existence of the elect? Let's go back to my picture here. They do say a, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, but look at this here. So if this is the, again, representation of the entire world, and then those closer to the top of the world are the elect. So who is Jesus talking about here? Who is he talking to? And who is, he, is he talking to the people at the bottom of the hill saying, or oh, I put it like this, is, John, is James referring to the people at the bottom of the hill who were not chosen that they need to recognize the elect? I'm going to say, for what? They're not chosen. So why do they need to recognize the elect? It is no benefit to them. They're not elect. They're never going to be elect. And then, of course, if he's saying that, who, so, so is Jesus talking to the people closest to the crowd, the ones he's already chosen? Is he, is he telling them this? Who is James referring to when he says that you need to recognize the elect? So what I'm saying is, look at the argument here. Who is this argument to? Right? Because... If it's to the people closest to the top of the hill, they don't need it. And if it's the people at the bottom of the hill, they don't need it. It's not, it is of no benefit to them. All right, here we go. The autonomous choice just simply isn't there. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit. When he says autonomous, meaning what? Free will? The free will that Jesus tells us to exercise? The free will that Jesus tells us here? Believe? Work for? Right? Work for? Memorize verse 45 along with verse 44. Very, very important. But then, and this is what caused me to start thinking about all this. In a number of the references in the dissertation, you would have, if it was a direct reference, John 665, there'd be a comparison to 644 or vice versa, or they both be cited together. And that's because they say so much the same thing, but 65 is a summary statement later on, after the discussion of eating the flesh and drinking the blood. We'll get to 65 later on in the video and in, in another video on our part. My first thought was not to cover this section here. He's getting ready to address some of the statements Jesus makes here to Roman Catholicism. I was going to skip through it, but there are a couple of points that I want to bring out. So I'll, I'll play through it and only comment on the what I intended to comment on. Which is not a separate discussion. This is the other thing. If, for example, you have Roman Catholic relatives, friends, 
uh, coworkers, whatever, you're not going to be able, I don't believe you're going to be able to address in a contextual, consistent format what Jesus is talking about when he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood until you see how that is related to what came before. So I agree with this. I just don't understand why he's bringing up the Catholicism because Catholicism have a whole lot of theological issues and theological issues is not even their source. It's the interpretation that comes from the hierarchy in Catholicism. Class, as you know, here at uh, Luther Vandross Preparatory Academy, we love diverse perspectives. Last week at Career Day, we heard from... All right, guys, I accidentally kind of switched over to another video, okay? Um, what I do is I'm, I, I got Safari up, and so I got the YouTube playing his, the video so that I can also do my scriptures side by side. So I accidentally hit a, another video that switched into another video. So I had to clear it out and start over. So, but here we go. Because what is in verses 37 and following, the high sovereignty of God, predestination election, it's right there. That's the context. Oh, let me let me go back because I didn't mean I, I shouldn't have cut him off. Uh, yeah, let's go back a little bit here. Following the high sovereignty of God, predestination election, it's right there. So when he says, and, and again, so that's the statement as far as Calvinism, right? Verse 45, uh, verse 44, well, actually verse 37, verse uh, 44, 45, 65, he says, so all of the essence or ingredients of Calvinism is right there. Sovereignty, right? But again, we're, we're challenging, is God really saying that? Is that his meaning? Okay. That's the context of Jesus emphasizing his own centrality and what believing in him actually means connecting so again what believing in him actually means let's see if he actually explains that by scripture right so listen let's go back for a moment um so remember when we look at verse number uh 26 he says really really i say unto you see you seek me because you saw the miracles but uh you you seek me not because you saw the miracles but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled leave it not for the meat which perishes but for the meat which endures to eternal life so so when he's so so remember he said the centrality of jesus the sovereignty of god and I'm going to say I agree because God in his sovereignty, this is the method he chose for salvation. This is why he tells them, labor for the food, right? Don't labor for the, don't labor for the meat that perish, perish, but for the meat that endureth into eternal life, right? And um, let me go back because uh, I, I, all right. I'm in the King James, and uh, I'll, I'll stay. I, I I didn't mean to get into the King James translation here, but that's all right. He said, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the food that endureth. That's why you see that endureth there. Unto eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give you. Which the Son of Man shall give you. Right? Then he says, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he sent. So this is the sovereignty of God right here. He's telling us how to believe. Now, when he says what God, what Jesus really meant, he's not going to do a James White. He's not going to do a Calvinist by go, what does all really mean? He's not going to tell us all of this 
only to get to verse 44 and to mean something completely different. All right. But you know what? Let me switch back here uh, to the New King James, okay? I don't know why I got onto the King James, but anyway, let's get to the New King James. All right. Back to the Passover and the giving of the bread, bread of life, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't see that everything that God does, like in verse 45, is so that his people come to Christ, and that eating his flesh and drinking his blood represents, communicates to us, his absolute centrality. We're not trying to join Jesus with a bunch of other things. That's what's so reprehensible about Union Theological Seminary and all, quote-unquote, inclusivistic deformations of the Christian faith. It's about Jesus. That's an exclusive claim. Try to add other stuff in there and you no longer have Christianity. So here's a problem here that, because you have to kind of remember, you have to remember what he means by that, what Calvinist means by that. If what he is saying is true, then why did Jesus tell them to do something? I agree it is, it's all about Jesus. Salvation, you cannot be saved without having Jesus in your mind, the center of everything that your faith is about. You, you can't do that, right? Because that's what you have faith in. I have faith in the fact that Jesus is the propitiation. He's the satisfaction. But you cannot, as they are doing, as Calvinists do, as James White is doing, X out what he told man to do, right? You can't X out, right? You can't X out, don't labor for the food that he's telling people to do, but for the food that endures eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. You can't X that out, which they do. <laughs> and say, forget that, it's all about Jesus. Why? The reason why they say that is because, well, God sovereignly chose, God draws, and you have nothing to do with it anyway. Which leads to a whole nother, and, and I always challenge that if, uh, if, 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 as he will say that the centrality of Christ totally X out man, in other words, we don't have to believe, it's because God only chose us, right? Okay, fine. Then you're either saved or you're not saved simply because God chose you. All right, fine. So what is he talking about then? What is the purpose of your argument? Because either way, it doesn't make any sense. Because if you're chosen, you don't need to, you don't need to tell the cho chosen. And if you're not chosen, it's not going to benefit what you're saying. All right. When you are continuously coming to Christ, that's what you see in the Supper. Because the Supper, every time you partake of the Supper, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes, right? Well, true, but when you continuously come to Christ, no man can come to... Don't you mean as you are continuously being drawn? Right? As you're continuously being drawn because no one can come to Jesus and let the Father unless the Father draws him? Proclaim the Lord's death in what context? That this is your only hope. That only by union with him, only by his death, only by his resurrection, only by his broken body and blood, do you have any hope at all? What hope? I mean, and I'm not trying to be funny, but if you just stop and think about this, what hope do we have or do we need? If God already sovereignly chose me, or if God didn't sovereignly choose me, what hope? If he didn't choose me, I don't have any hope. I will never have hope. I can never have hope. 
But if he's already chosen me, but what hope is it? Is it a done deal? I'm chosen. I just need to be told, right, that I'm hope. And if I'm not hope, right, I, I still don't understand the Calvinist, how do you know you're chosen? But that's a whole nother story here. That's what was so horrible about the syncretistic religion in Israel when they would build the high places, the Ashrim, the Baals, is because so many of these people would would offer the sacrifices at, at the tabernacle or the temple and then go to the Baals. We frequently do the same thing now, not seeing the absolutely exclusivistic nature of the message of the gospel itself. So I'm going to say, who doesn't see it? Those who are not chosen? Well, of course they're not going to see it. They're not chosen. But if you're chosen, you're going to see it, <laughs> according to Calvinism. It becomes very important in looking at the rest of, of that. But I want you to see this right here. Udais uh, dunatai elthine pros me. So no one is able to come pros me. Eon, unless, so we're in the subjunctive here. No one is able to come to me unless... The Father, the one who sent me, draws him. So, Ian May, conditional uh, form. And so, no one, Dunatai, has the capacity, Elthine, to come, Pros May. And you may notice this little thing right here. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here and I'm going to pick this up and go further into this in uh, part six, okay? Uh, so, because I want to really give some time to it. I want to give some time to it. I think it deserves some time, but, um, all right guys, don't, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome, and I will see you in part six.